This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Edward Slingerland, who is professor of philosophy at uh, University of British Columbia up in uh, Vancouver, and also the author of uh, multiple books, most recently this one, uh, Drunk, uh, How We Sip, Danced, and Stumbled Our Way to Civilization. Um, also this one, um, Trying Not to Try, um, Ancient China, Modern Science, and the Power of Spontaneity. And then there's another book on um, what uh, science can offer the humanities, uh, which I don't have with me. And and I feel like I should have, we should have done this later in the day and I could, I could have a, um, a, I could have a glass yeah, of we should wine be drinking. while we're, we're, That'd be more appropriate, yeah. <laughs> right? Otherwise, uh, you know, we might not, uh, we might be too stiff when we're, yeah. uh, we're talking, our PFC is going to be too yeah, active throughout this, this conversation. Yeah. But I have to say that these two books are probably two of the most interesting books that I've read in a, a really, really long time <laughs> uh, because they do combine insights from uh, cognitive science and psychology from philosophy, uh, you know, from, um, uh, religion. Uh, in fact, if I didn't know that you were a professor of philosophy, I, I would have trouble trying to figure out exactly what you were uh, a professor of because yeah. you seamlessly yeah, a lot of people put together wonder about that. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, what, what, perhaps we'll talk a bit about what, um, the humanities and the sciences can offer each, each other. But I think maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll just kind of do it. And we'll start off by, by talking about the most recent book, uh, Drunk, which I, I see it as sort of a natural outgrowth of, you know, some of the themes that you talked about in, in trying not to try. Yeah. Um, but I, but I think what you, what you do is you look at, you look at, uh, the consumption of alcohol and, um, you do like so many others do now and you wonder, Hey, is this, you know, is this a natural thing? I mean, it seems to be so harmful. We see all the alcoholism. We see all the early deaths. We see the people, you know, crashing their cars. We, you know, we see the the domestic abuse and violence. And, and so many people are saying, hey, you know, this is something we really need to get rid of. And it's, we have a difficult time explaining it. Um, and so, you know, evolutionary biologists, they're, they're always uh, looking to either show that, that something enhances fitness or that if it doesn't enhance fitness, it's, it's some kind of, um, you know, legacy of something, there's a mismatch mm -hmm. or, or something. And then there's others that say, well, you know, it might look like a mismatch, but you know, it still makes some sense like, like an appendix. So is, is drinking, right. Is drinking something that is an inherent part of what it means to, to be, to be human or is, is it, you know, something either a mismatch or, or a hijack and maybe we can, you know, dig into what those, those theories are and, and how you came to wonder, right. You know, what drinking is and how it fits into our nature as human beings. Right. So the, the standard scientific story is our taste for alcohol is an evolutionary mistake. And within that general claim, there's two different types of subclaims. So one is there's two different types of mistakes it could be. So one is I call evolutionary hijack. And this is where a reward circuit is getting uh, tapped into, even though the thing you're doing is not what the reward circuit is for. And so the classic example that I start the book with is masturbation. Right. Uh, evolution gives us the best thing it has at its disposal, <laughs> um, the biggest carrot for the thing that most directly serves its interests, which is reproductive sex, which is passing on copies of itself to the next generation. And yet humans and other species have figured out that we could game the system and get the reward for not doing the thing we're supposed to do. So we engage in all sorts of non-reproductive sex. We get the orgasm anyway, even though we should really, right? Um, so that's a classic hijack. We're getting like Diet Coke. What's that? It, yeah, it's like cocaine it's like, is cocaine probably is a hijack. I was gonna say diet it's like Diet Coke, even. Oh, diet, diet Coke doesn't Coke. even give you the calories, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, there definitely are uh examples of hijacks where we're just we're we're clever primates and we figured out how to how to trigger that reward circuit, even though what we're doing is not what the circuit's for. Um, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is a mismatch, as you said. So um, classic example of that is that I give the book is junk food, right? So this is, we have a taste, we get rewarded for eating fat and sugar and protein 
for a very good reason, because those were traditionally, you know, for most of our evolutionary history in really short supply. And so organisms that when they came across them would gorge on them did better um, than ones that didn't. This only becomes a problem in the modern world, modern industrialized, rich world, where we have access to too many calories and we go down to the corner store and get Twinkies and Slim Jims, sugary um, cola drinks. So, so that's a classic mismatch. Now, in the case of hijack, so we're talking about. So, so that's, so that's like, a, that's kind of like the drunken monkey, right? Yep. That, you know, sniffs out the, the ripe fruit. And sometimes, you know, if it's alcoholic, that means it's really yeah. ripe. And, and, uh, you know, because the alcoholic vapors spread far and wide, it's, it's, you know, it's, it pays to be, uh, attuned to that and to, to kind of sniff yep. it out. Yeah. Robert, Robert Dudley at UC Berkeley, right? That's his hypothesis. So that's a classic mismatch. So it was adaptive, the taste for alcohol led you to calories in our evolutionary environment. But now, when, as he puts it at one point in his book, The Drunken Monkey, you know, now we can walk into a supermarket and have rows of wine. Now it's not adaptive. So, so that's classic mismatch. The problem with both of these, so in the case of masturbation, evolution doesn't care about fixing it because it works well enough. Evolution is... Well, as long as, as, long as you're also continuing to kind of seek after the real thing yeah so apparently it works well enough <laughs> you know, somewhere in that among all the masturbating and non-reproductive sex we managed to have enough reproductive sex that we're here to talk about it so um in this case you know masturbation is low cost um and it it's evolution doesn't need to be perfect it just needs to be good enough um in the case of junk food that's more costly um so it leads to serious health consequences obesity diabetes um, but it's relatively recent problem. And even now it's still geographically constrained. So there are plenty of parts of the world where getting enough calories is a problem for people still. So in that case, evolution. I mean, we, we, we could, we, we could imagine a world where if in fact, right, diabetes has a significant kind of fitness impact that, um, you know, we will evolve a, a taste, uh, well, our taste for sugars will, will kind of, you know, be mitigated over time, you would right? If you there would was imagine a serious that fitness because if it, given yeah. the cost, if it if it did become the case that everyone had access to lots and lots of sugar, and it had fitness impacts, we should uh, our taste for it should disappear. There would be selective pressure against it. Um, so that's you know that's it's still in our gene pool because it's a relatively local and recent problem. Alcohol isn't like either one of those cases. It's it's really costly. Like the junk food, it's really costly, right? It's harmful physiologically. Worse than junk food, it leads to all sorts of um, behavioral problems of taking in excess, social problems, alcoholism. It's estimated that probably 15% of the human population is genetically prone to alcoholism. So just people could not, these people could not drink alcohol safely. And that's where a lot of the problem behavior comes from. Um, so it's costly. It's also ancient and global rather than recent and local. So we've been producing and consuming alcohol for as long as we've been doing anything in an organized way as a species uh, before. And this is what really, in doing the research for the book, one of the things that surprised me the most, you know, I was told, you know, I kind of somehow absorbed this uh, evolutionary mistake idea about intoxicants. It's just triggering a reward circuit. Um, I'd also taken for granted the standard story about the origin of alcohol production, which is that it was also a mistake. So we had agriculture, we figured out how to grow grains, make bread, and then someone left their sourdough starter out for too long and started to ferment and they tasted it, made them feel good. So they, they you know, we had beer, but um, it looks like that's. And then, well, related to that was this, this idea that, oh, well, you know, it's a way of preserving food, right? It's, yeah. It's a way of getting rid of, uh, you know, contaminants and, and, uh, toxins, right. Through, um, uh, sterilization, right. There's that argument. Oh, in the middle ages, you didn't have any, you know, drinking the drink, clean water, the, the so dirty you water beer thing. for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, that's right. That yeah. theory drives me crazy. So th those are two other mismatch theories is the dirty water hypothesis. So we didn't have access to clean water. So we, um, you ferment contaminated water, it gets purified. Um, the basic problem with that is. The other way to deal with contaminated water is to boil it. 
it's a lot faster and simpler than, I mean, making beer is an incredibly elaborate process. You've got to like malt grain and there's like several steps. It takes a really long time. Um, if dirty water is your problem, boil it. Um, Pete, you don't need to understand the germ theory of disease to stumble upon boiling water. Um, so it doesn't make sense. Um, cultures that drink only boiled water, like for a very long time, China, um, China, there's a kind of fairly strong taboo against drinking. They don't think of it as untreated water, but um, non-boiled water is considered bad for you. It hel- it hurts your stomach chi, is the the Chinese medical theory. Um, it's you know we would say from a modern perspective, it's safer because it's been sterilized. Um, so they drink only boiled water and tea, and they still have plenty of alcohol. So it also you know doesn't make any mm-hmm. sense. Um, and and also cultures that have alcoholic beverages and beers often also drink untreated water on the side. So it just doesn't it doesn't hold up. And the preservation food preservation one is interesting because you can um, certain fruits that are going to spoil if you ferment them and turn them into a wine they'll last longer. Um, beer is not great. Beer before the hops actually didn't last for very long. You had to drink it pretty quickly. Um, and things like chicha, the beer they make out of maize in South America has to be drunk right away. Um, but you know, certainly once you get distillation, you can preserve calories for a really long time. Um, but distillation is again, one of the surprises of the book was distillation is relatively recent invention. Um, we've known about it for a long time. Aristotle describes it. But it's technologically really difficult to pull off. You have to be able, you have to have metallurgy, you have to be able to control temperatures really precisely. It's, it's actually quite hard to do in practice. So we didn't have distilled liquors on a large scale in, in Europe until like 1700s, 1600s, 1700s. Um, and if it's, you know, what we're interested in is food preservation, make a nice yogurt or a porridge, you know, just to have all the benefits, you get the same preservation. But you don't get a hangover. Um, so, but you mentioned that there's never been a a um, world conquering civilization that was uh, based on on porridge, yogurt yeah, drinks. Yeah, and you don't sacrifice, you know, porridge to the ancestors or yogurt. You sacrifice alcohol because that's the that's the center of most cultures. Um, so yeah, so it was. It's not a it's not a mistake. None of the all of these various mismatch theories. It's not impossible that they're playing some role. Um, you know, it's, there's, Mm -hmm. these are not mutually exclusive theories about alcohol. They could all be contributing something. There certainly is one of the more interesting things about the nutrition theories is that if you ferment grain into beer, the action of the yeast adds a bunch of micro, really crucial micronutrients. And one of the theories is that, especially for poor laborers in early agricultural societies where suddenly they're kind of stuck living on starches almost exclusively. Um, this is what allowed them to survive because they're not getting fresh vegetables. They're not getting fruit anymore because they're not hunter gatherers anymore, but beer contains some of those micronutrients that you would get from vegetables and fruit. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, but that can't be, that can't be the whole story. Um, especially because, People are drinking beer, making and drinking beer thousands of years before we have agriculture. And so that's what surprised me the most doing the research is that, um, you know, this is a so-called beer before bread hypothesis, that human beings were hunter-gatherers, were getting together, making beer, uh, constructing these monumental religious sites and having rituals. We don't know exactly what they were doing thousands of years before agriculture. And, and the argument then is that um, the motivation for settling down and actually starting to cultivate plants was not bread or nutrition. It was the psychoactive properties. People were motivated to become farmers so they could more efficiently get drunk. And this is really, you know, it really turns on its head, this idea of the relationship between agriculture for food and intoxication. And you see this. I think another reason why they got another reason why I should be suspicious of the mismatch theory that you highlight is that um, it's not just that um, it's super harmful in many ways to the individual human being, but you also mentioned that enormous resources yeah. are, are devoted to the the production of alcohol, which could presumably be devoted to the manufacture of of, of weapons or yeah. or you know the 
production of, of nutritious foods or whatever. And so if, if, you know, if, if you have a civilization that's devoting a huge amount of resources to this and, and it was, uh, coming at the expense of this other stuff, one would think that those societies would kind of, kind of get wiped yeah. out. Yeah. No, it's, it's estimated that an ancient Sumer, 50% of the grain production went to beer. So they're taking half of their nutritious grain and turning it into a low dose neurotoxin. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And any, there's so many costs, just not physiologically, but also, as you point out, you know, investment in the society in terms of labor, energy, and, and foodstuffs, that something's got to be going on to, to pay for it on the other side. So that the motivation for writing dream you made, was, you made, you, made, you, you made me reflect on how much money I spend on, on yeah, alcohol. Well, I, I went over my finances and it was, it was kind of shocking. Yeah, no, and you think, I mean, so one of the stats I cite in the book is that one, people spend report spending one third of what they spend on food on alcohol. So that's a pretty big chunk of your income. And it's almost certainly an under report because in large parts of the world, the intoxicants are black market. So you, you don't really get accurate reports of that. Um, and I look at my household, especially if you like decent wine, you know, you're spending a good chunk of your income on this thing. Um, it becomes, you know, when you get into good wine, there are other factors going on, right? It's aesthetics. And then you could say, well, we spend my on art and nice furniture as opposed to cheaper furniture. But um, this has been going on for a really long time and, and long enough and with a high enough cost that there's got to be some benefits on the other side that are paying for it. So that was the motivation to write the book was just trying to uncover what the benefits are. And, you know, it's, it's related to some, it's related to trying not to try in a variety of ways, but it's also related to my previous work on the cognitive science and evolution of religion. And in some ways, Drunk is a similar project to what we did. We had a big interdisciplinary grant on the evolution of religion at UBC many years ago. And the basic question was the same. It was taking something that is universal and assumed. So you go to a new culture and they are worshiping invisible beings and sacrificing things to them and scarifying themselves and not eating certain delicious foods and engaging in long, boring, painful rituals. And then if they're a large-scale society, you guaranteed the biggest, most impressive, and expensive building in their settlement is useless. It's some religious monument that has very little or no practical purpose, right? Um, you look at ancient China, my area of specialty, and something like the uh, first emperor of Qin's tomb, you know, the this massive underground terracotta army. I mean, they built a terracotta army of individual soldiers. They were all different from one another. They were armed with real weapons. They put the highest tech military stuff they had in, in there. They put in jade and bronze vessels, which are really incredibly difficult to make. Um, they built a, essentially an entire city and fake army, and then they buried it. <laughs> that's it no one could use it first they killed a bunch of people and tossed them in there then they buried it um and you just have to think that a society just like that one but that invested in real soldiers and real stuff you know like an irrigation network instead of this crazy tomb would do better and yet it's not true um, if we look at societies the ones that go in for waste wasteful what seem like wasteful costly rituals and um, investments, material seem to do better than ones that don't. And so religion is this kind of mystery. We see people doing it everywhere. It's costly. It seems to have no benefits. So what's going on? And so that project, we were arguing that religion actually probably does have some benefits, both the individual and group level that are paying for the cost. And I, I see drunk as basically doing, applying the same lens to chemical intoxicants. We take for granted, we see them everywhere. It doesn't surprise us when we dig up ancient wineries and see people investing all this energy and growing crops that just get used to make neurotoxins. Um, but we should be more confused or puzzled by that than we are. And so it's, it's kind of, I look at it as kind of trying to look at these mysteries that are hiding in plain sight. They're things that we take for granted that humans do that if we really start to think about it from an evolutionary perspective, it's really puzzling. 
Well, I mean, religion is something that's unique to humans, I guess, and so is really, you know, widespread alcohol consumption. But I think when when people are thinking about what makes uh, humans different from their primate relatives and from other animals in general, you know, they don't really think about those things. They think about, right, um, our rational capacities, Mm -hmm. right? They think about, you know, we're the only animal with a, with a, with a, prefrontal cortex that, you know, is super active. Yeah. You know, if we take the cognitive science view of things and we think about our system one and system two, which is what I spend much of my time doing, right? Working with my students to try to cultivate their, right, their more mm-hmm. rational side and to be hyper aware of how their uh, less rational side is influencing their decisions, mm-hmm. right? And we think that, you know, kind of the more highly developed our, our PFC is, Kind of the more the more human we are, yeah. um, and uh, but th- th- I think you're you're saying that even though humans are, are naturally unnatural in this mm-hmm. way, right? Um, it comes at a cost, yeah. Uh, and uh, and you know there's a trade off there, and that we lose something when we become kind of more uh, more rational, absolutely. Um, and did, is it? And so that seemed that presumably was the inspiration for for kind of all of your work was really an understanding of this this trade off, yeah. It's- Especially, I think the reason I was able to see the trade-off maybe more clearly than if I had been trained in a different way is that my specialty is early Chinese philosophy, which unlike, you know, this this hyper-rationality is very much a product of enlightenment thought, right? And you can trace it back to Plato, but it's, it really takes off and becomes the dominant mode of philosophy in Northern Europe, you know, in the Enlightenment. And this this emphasis on instrumental rationality and self control, uh, conscious decision making. You know, it's uh, I rem- I remember very vividly the moment when I decided as a young person that I wasn't going to study Western philosophy, and it was this passage in uh, Kant in the the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, where he's talking about this. Uh, amiable person. So it's someone who is generous and kind, but they do it um, aus, aus neigel, out of inclination rather than aus flicht, out of a sense of duty. And Kant says, well, that person, they're okay, but their actions are not moral. You know, for an action to be moral, you have to stop. You have to think, is what I'm about to do in accordance with the categorical imperative? Yes, it is. PFC, engage, <laughs> I'm going to force myself to do this thing. That's moral behavior. It's conscious, it's willed, um, it's rational, it's rationally motivated. And, you know, inclination-based emotions or dispositions are not even, we don't even talk about them in moral philosophy. Um, and that just seems so us backwards to me. It just seemed to me that, you know, actually I would trust the guy who's amiable rather than the guy who's thinking about um, the categorical imperative. And that I discovered as I started to learn a little bit more about Chinese philosophy is that was their view as well. So in early China, uh, there's actually an interesting passage in Shunzi, one of these later warring state Confucians, where he's ranking moral agents. And it's basically the opposite of Kant's evaluation. So, well, he thinks the person who's not moral is the worst. Um, And then above them is the person who isn't inclined to be moral, but they can think about ritual and what the Tao would say. And basically they're Kant's agent and they're okay. But the best agent, the sage, just spontaneously and naturally and unselfconsciously does the right thing in every situation. Um, Spontaneity is valued and not, you know, rational top-down control. And I just think that's a much, it, I came to feel like that's a much more, it much better fits folk intuitions about kind of who's a trustworthy moral agent. Uh, and and I think better fits the way we really try to train our kids to be good in the way that, um, so I got very invested in the virtue ethics movement and philosophy, which was trying to bring back disposition-based, spontaneity-based views of ethical training, decision-making. So yeah, too much, um, too, rationality is great. The PFC is super important, right? We wouldn't have it. It's really expensive organ, and we wouldn't have it if it wasn't doing something really important. Um, but it can get in the way. And so I think one, 
I think you're right that one way to look at a lot of my work is exploring the downsides of the PFC and the importance of these, these system one, either innate system one systems or retrain. So for virtue ethicists like the Confucians, they don't want you to be spontaneous the way you are when you're a kid, or even if you're an untrained agent, they want you to train. But the idea is by training, you reshape your system. You use system two to reshape system one so that it matches what system two thinks is desirable. But then you kind of toss system two overboard and you rely on these transformed dispositions. Um, and that's, that seems to me a more plausible, psychologically plausible model of how moral agents work. So, right. So I guess when we're, we're teaching, stu we're teaching students or, or children, right. How to become better people, or even when we're trying to teach them how to be uh, better at some skill, yeah. right. Like playing the piano or something like that. We, we generally are, are trying to have them use their system to, to kind of cultivate their system one, mm -hmm. right? System one is, is a slow learning yeah. and uh, system two can kind of, you know, learn much more quickly. Yeah. But if you're, if your system two is, is, you know, activated, it might actually kind of get in the way of, of accomplishing what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. You talk about that quite a bit. Yeah. And trying to try and look at the, a lot of the, um, the choking literature. So the literature on expert performance and, and overthinking. And if you're a trained expert, uh, in a physical skill. So if you're a highly trained athlete, paying attention to your technique actually messes you up. So if you tell a professional baseball player to, as they're trying to hit the ball, think about the arc they're swinging the bat through, they won't be able to hit the ball anymore. <laughs> so it's, and that's, and when P and that's mm -hmm. the key to choking, right? So, um, when people high, especially high level athletes are playing poorly, I mean, it's, I, I'm interested, I play tennis at an amateur level and I'm trying to get better. But um, I think tennis is a great example of this because it's a it's a sport that you cannot do properly unless you're relaxing certain muscles while simultaneously tightening other muscles. And there are mm -hmm. several things like a, a serve, a proper serve and a forehand that you really can't do if you're not relaxed. And when you look at high level tennis players, they, they all are super conditioned. They're, um, you know, they've been playing since they were kids. They've internalized all of these moves. When they start to play poorly, it's because they're overthinking things. And, you know, it's at the highest level of tennis competition. It, it's all about the mind. It's all about whether or not you can be in the zone or not. And. It seems to be that mental toughness that allows you to stay relaxed in the zone is what separates successful professional athletes from others. But I'm trying to try, I'm trying to point out that this is not a problem just for athletes. It's a problem for performers. Um, so people who worry about this a lot are also actors and comedians who know that, you know, if I go out there and try to be funny, it's going to really suck. Um, and if people aren't laughing and I start to try harder to be funny, it's going to get even worse. Um, but even, you know, so those are communities have always known about this and they have their own, uh, folklore about kind of how you get into it and how you avoid choking. Um, but also we, I don't think we recognize in our daily lives, this is the problem, right? You, um, you want to go on a podcast and have a, you know, have a good conversation with your host, you gotta be relaxed at some level, right? If you're, if you're not, you're going to be stiff and awkward. Um, you, you're on a first date with someone and you want to impress them. You impress them by not trying to impress them, right? You impress them by just being yourself and being confident, relaxed, but you know, how do you make yourself relax when, if you know that being spontaneous is going to allow you to do better. How do you make yourself be spontaneous? And that, that's the central paradox of trying not to try the, the theme of that, that first trade book. Um, and the seed for drunk came from uh, me thinking about the fact that the, the early Chinese give you all these techniques to get around the paradox. And I argue it's a genuine paradox because when you're, you're trying to relax, the part of the brain you're activating, the PFC, is actually the part you're trying to shut down. It's like saying to someone, don't think of a white bear. 
they will think of a white bear because you've just activated that concept in their brains. Um, so the Chinese have all these strategies for trying to get you around it indirectly, you know, meditation or ritual practice or do this thing and try not to think, worry about it too much. But it occurred to me at one point that alcohol might be a technology that cultures have stumbled upon to get you around the paradox of trying not to try. Because what you can do with alcohol is to just take a substance that will reach in directly to your brain, turn the PFC down a few notches. Um, so it gets you around the paradox because you're not trying to use the PFC to shut the PFC down. You're using your elbow to shut your PFC down. <laughs> So um, that that was that's one of the direct lines between the, my first project and Drunk as well is this kind of um, alcohol as a cultural technology for solving this paradox. Well, it's like when you tell someone, you know, just just relax. Yeah. Come on, just just yes. relax. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't work. work. <laughs> and um, I remember when I first started teaching, I had you know I was, I was always very nervous and wanted to impress and make sure I had all the answers, yeah. and I had this, you know, slide deck that had all the words and things that I was hoping to get across. And, you know, it was only after I started relaxing and, and, um, you know, not, not caring quite as much yeah. <laughs> that, that I was able to, um, uh, kind of pull it off. But I think that, you know, people also, when they're observing a, a performer, they appreciate the performer, uh, more so if they think that what they're doing is in some way, uh, improvised or, or spontaneous, right? So if you listen to a, a jazz soloist, if you, if you find out that, well, you know, that, that's the same exact solo that that yeah. person has done 50 times, then, you know, you lose a bit of, of, of respect for that, uh, for that performer. Yeah. Right? yeah. You feel like it's less genuine. You feel it's more rehearsed. Yeah. Um, or if you, one of the reasons why I was always afraid to use the same joke yeah. in, in multiple it's sections painful. of the yeah. same <laughs> class was that, I said they'd compare notes and they'd find out. <laughs> yeah, know, and certain joke about it, uh, your, yeah, yeah. Um, so, but you know, I so I don't lecture as much anymore. I tend to do more flip classroom stuff so that I'm not just giving the same lecture over and over. But when I did give the same lectures, teach the same class, um, I would sometimes use the same joke. Mm -hmm. The key to it was having it seem funny and. Like it just came to me each time <laughs> and there is a way to do that. Like actors can do that, right? They can, they can seem grief stricken and, and it really seems like it's happening to them in the moment. Um, so there is a, we don't, one of the other themes in trying not to try was this connection between spontaneity and trust and, and kind of, and liking. So kind of affiliation. So we, uh, we like people who seem relaxed and like they're not trying too hard. And the question is why? And so for the Chinese, uh, it's a it's a theological explanation. So they think that when you're in a state of wu-wei, this state of effortless action, you're in harmony with the Tao, with this the way the universe is. And heaven, this Tian, this kind of supreme being, is pleased with you and gives you this power. And the power is called da in modern Mandarin, unfortunately, but it, it translates as like charisma or charismatic power. Um, and that's what makes people attracted to you. And if you're a Confucian ruler, it's what makes people want to come serve you, even though you don't make them. And if you're a Taoist, it was, it's what allows you to kind of move among people without being harmed and also relax other people. And so they have a theological explanation. So I was trying to come up with, well, let's, how can we explain this naturalistically? And this is, this required a deep dive. This is always where I lose popular audiences when I was doing the book tour, um, was explaining the evolutionary dynamics going on here, because it really has to do with game theory and cooperation theory. Um, so we, uh, we constantly face cooperation dilemmas, especially large scale societies that go by different names and are sometimes slightly different in structure, but are fundamentally the same. So prisoner's dilemma, tragedy of the commons, uh, these situations where the, the best outcome for everyone is if we trust each other and cooperate. If we can do that, each of us individually will also do better, but we're vulnerable to defection, as economists would say, right? We're vulnerable to people who aren't going to cooperate. And if we get, if they defect on us, we're going to be in big trouble. 
worse off than if we were selfish. And so the only rational strategy in that case is to be selfish. But human beings aren't selfish. We actually solve prisoners' dilemmas all the time in daily life. And I was really influenced um, by Robert. Do you know Robert Frank's work? Cornell? Yeah, I, I interviewed him. He was one of my earliest podcasts. Okay, okay. Uh, so his, I was really inspired by his um, passions within reason, right? So his argument is <clears throat> emotions are a solution to this cooperation problem. So if I love you or I, uh, you're my friend and I'm loyal to you, or we are part of uh, the same gang and we are honorable gangsters and we, you know, we observe the rules, we respect our, our group, um, that binds us in certain ways. Um, I think Frank uses the analogy of you when Ulysses ties himself to the mast so that when he, they sail by the sirens, he doesn't jump in. You know, his, his previous self is binding his future self. And we do that when we emotionally commit to another person. We're deliberately restricting our future behavior in order to allow cooperation to work. Um, so that's the solution to this problem. But it creates another problem, which is, um, you know, evolution never rests. And so now there's going to be an incentive to be able to fake those emotional, those emotions, right? If I can make you feel like I'm a loyal friend, even though I'm not, that's even better because I get all the payoffs of friendship. But then when it's time to move your couch, you know, my van's in the shop and I can't help you, <laughs> right? I'm a, I'm a defector. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's going to then create pressure on people to get better at detecting faking. And so you're going to predict a kind of evolutionary arms race where between cheaters and cheater detectors. And it's interesting because you, you know, evolutionary arms races are often what's going on when you see extreme traits in species. So, you know, cheetahs and gazelles are, they're stupidly fast. Like why there's no need for an organism. They're wastefully fast, but they're trapped in this arms race where they have to keep going because if you're a gazelle, you have to keep being faster than the cheetah. Um, I think this has happened with humans in our theory of mind and our ability to detect emotions and others, um, compared to chimpanzees. We have a su I have a supernaturally good ability. I'm not particularly good at mind reading or face reading, but I can tell if you're bored. I can tell if you want fun. I can tell if you don't like me um, in an instant, right? And it, it would seem magical to a chimpanzee that we can do this, but it's because we've developed this ability to read tiny little micro expressions. And Frank walks through, he relies a lot on uh, Ekman's work on emotional expressions, kind of walks through some of the cues we're using. Um, and so that explains why, why we like signs of spontaneity is that when we see someone acting in a way that seems spontaneous, we assume they're not engaging their PFC and therefore they're not being rationally self-interested. They're, they're not thinking strategically. I mean, economists, uh, do in the ultimatum game, if it's a single shot, you know, they, they tend to do, uh, um, you know, they, they 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 tend to accept very very low yeah. offers, which um, means that they they'll do better than than someone who rejects those low offers. But it, hey, if you know you're playing with an economist, it's yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's wonderful. Yeah, economists <laughs> economists know, are could... the only people who behave rationally in the ultimatum game are economists and analytic philosophers. <laughs> you know, it's just no right. one else does, and and why not? Because you get angry, right? So ultimatum games one of the examples I use of how emotions are useful, right? And, and Frank talks, I got this example from Frank, actually, because he's talking about, um, you know, being taken advantage of in an economic exchange, a rational agent's going to get just abused. So economists out mm -hmm. in the wild are just going to get screwed over constantly because <laughs> everyone knows that they're rational hey. patsies. Um, whereas the person you're not yep. going to mess with is the hot wire person who's going to, you might give them an unfair offer, you're going to get pissed off and break your leg. Um, you're going to tend to give them a fair offer. So, um, so that's why, yeah, we trust, we trust people who are spontaneous. Um, there's this concern about cheating and my argument, um, one of the arguments for the function of alcohol, but I lost you there in video. It's okay. Should I keep going? Good. Okay. So you can just keep going. Cause I, I, it'll, it'll be recorded locally. Okay. It's recorded locally. Um, so one of the functions of alcohol is to help out with this 
this arms race. So cultures are not uninterested bystanders. They want the cheater detectors to do better. They want us to be able to solve uh, prisoners' dilemmas. And so one of the ways they can do that is by coming up with a technology that will uh, basically help the, help the cheetah um, be faster and slow down the gazelle. And alcohol is one of the ways we do that. So the cheating is very PFC heavy. Um, if I'm faking it, like if I'm pretending to be someone I'm not, if I'm lying to you, that's cognitively really demanding task. I've got to hold in my head both what's really the case and what I'm telling you the case is. I've got to uh, suppress leakage, you know, emotional expression leakage that reflects reality instead of what I'm telling you is the truth. It's really cognitively taxing to lie. Um, takes it, use some alcohol, turn the PSC down a few notches. It's harder to lie. Uh, people are less successful liars. Um, the other interesting thing that was less intuitive is that there's evidence that we're better lie detectors when we're a little drunk. Mm -hmm. The PFC is actually the enemy with lie detection because we, we think, we think our system too knows how to detect lies, but it doesn't. You know, we read some Sherlock Holmes novel and we learned some stupid trick about, you know, when people are lying, it doesn't actually work. You're better at detecting lying. Maybe, maybe that's, maybe, maybe that's why, maybe that's why all that, uh, training that, uh, the TSA got yeah, from Ekman's exactly. uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, program. It didn't yeah. work because the TSA folks weren't yeah, drunk. Were they they yeah. couldn't pick up on those micro expressions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the best way to pick up on the micro expression seems to be to relax and just take in a mm -hmm. wide bandwidth of information and let your system one sort it out and tell you there's something sh shady about this guy. But if you're relying on system two, a list checklist of stuff, you're not going to do very well. Um, so this is why I argue this is why in all cultures throughout history, whenever you get a bunch of potentially hostile people who need to come together and trust each other, or move on with their quarrel, nobody starts talking until everyone's drunk, <laughs> right? And it's, it's like shaking, you shake hands to show you're not carrying a weapon. You do a few shots with somebody, it's like taking your PFC out, putting it on the table and saying, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm cognitively disarmed. So you can, the things I'm saying now, you can trust. They're not calculated. Mm -hmm. I read a fascinating uh, story about how the African National Congress uh, approached the um, National Party prior to the release of Nelson Mandela from prison. And the thing that really kind of accelerated that peace process was where the, the military leaders on both sides all went out uh, drinking yeah. heavily yeah. Um, in the in the bush and uh, forged you know these relationships um, you know very 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 human sort of thing mm -hmm. um, and it, it's I guess it's why you know in so many cultures particularly Chinese culture uh, there's just so much ceremonial drinking around business mm -hmm. and, and in Japan uh, as well and so it, this is kind of a substitute for for say courts it's a substitute for contracts it's a substitute for these more uh kind of formalized arm's length ways of of you know building uh, partnerships mm -hmm. um do you think that 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 i mean there must be some feedback loop right where the the chinese uh or eastern conception uh positive understanding of 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 humans and uh the positive description of of humans in the west where we're kind of believed to be strategic and, and, and believed to be, um, you know, utilitarian in that way, uh, have, have led to these different kind of ways of enforcing agreements. Uh, could, could it, you know, could the causation flow both ways? Right? Yeah, that's interesting. Where we have now that, you know, we have more heavily, <laughs> you know, we have the courts. And so since we have the courts, we don't really need the drinking and we don't need to, uh, promote it or protect it, yeah. or, um, you know, enshrine it in, in our business relationships. That's an interesting point. I guess I would dispute the claim that we don't need it anymore. But I think you're right that there, um, there's re relative prevalence, right? And you're going to have a hydraulic relationship between rule of law and then informal mechanisms like religion. Because um, religion is mm -hmm. a big one too, right? I swear before the gods, I make a costly sacrifice to show you that I'm really a believer. That's another way you get trust going in non-contract mm -hmm. environments, non-institution-based environments. Um, but yeah, I hadn't thought about that, that maybe because uh, 
even, you know, even in the modern world, a lot of Chinese economic relations, business relations are through Guanxi networks, right? Through connections, personal connections that they would rely more on the drinking than we do in the West. Um, but it's still the case that, um, no contract covers everything. <laughs> right. And so if it's a relatively simple right. thing, like I'm going to, I'm contracting you to deliver me some, um, paper clips. I'm probably download an app. Yeah. I'm a download an app on my phone. I don't need to have a drink with the, right. the, the yeah, company that makes it. Probably it probably is, is okay. Um, but if I'm engaged in a really long-term complex, uh, undertaking with you where there's lots of lead, there's always leeway, right? Um, <clears throat> that's mm -hmm. when I'm going to get on a plane and fly to Shanghai and get drunk with you before I sign the contract. And so my argument in the book is, you know, when Skype was invented, everyone was like, oh, well, business travel is going to stop because why would you fly to Shanghai if you could just Skype with people um, or email them? Um, well, people still flew to Shanghai and it's because even with contracts, and I think you're right that to the degree to which contracts are enforced and comprehensive, it probably does drive out the need a bit for the drinking and the informal stuff, but it doesn't completely eliminate it because there is so much wiggle room, even in the best constructed contract. Um, people still want to know they can trust the people they're doing business with. Um, and it also helps. It still is important for, um, getting, you know, I also talk in the book about this, the big grant we got for the evolution of religion was this interdisciplinary grant. And it was a partnership grant. So it was the point of the grant was to bring together different universities and different disciplines to work on a common problem together. Um, but a lot of these groups were competitors in a way, like they were working on similar problems from different perspectives and didn't like each other, you know, or thought the other person's approach was wrong. And uh, I had to, so I got this $3 million grant and we were going to start having these meetings where we were going to try to get everyone to work together. But I wasn't allowed by SHRC or, or federal granting agency doesn't allow you to use mm -hmm. grant money on alcohol. And I was like, we cannot do this without alcohol. <laughs> There's no way you're going to get these mm -hmm. people to cooperate. Um, and so we actually put together a black fund among ourselves to just use for reimbursing ourselves for the alcohol part of the meals because, um, you want to get potentially hostile people or people who just are not fully on board with working together to relax, to let their guard down. Um, you need, you need something and you know, there are other ways to do it. So I think that, um, you know, companies, you could have had some ayahuasca, you have, there, some, there are other, uh, psilocybin. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The problem is those really knock you out, right? There's a reason alcohol is used because it's relatively short lasting. It doesn't disconnect you from reality that much. Um, but there are non-chemical, well, and it's all chemical, right? There are non-chemical ingestible drug ways to do this. Um, you know, some companies have replaced, you know, the annual office party with heavy drinking, with laser tag outings or, you know, rock climbing. And it's probable that that's doing some of the same stuff. So with extreme exercise or getting, you know, absorbed in some kind of game, you can get some of that same down regulation of the PFC effect. Um, so there are other ways to do it. It just alcohol is really efficient and pleasurable way to do it. Well, it seems to be a streak, um, uh, sort of a puritanical streak, um, throughout, uh, at least in the United States, probably in, in other countries where, um, the, the belief is that it's all cost and, and no benefit, right? The only benefit is, uh, you know, fun, yeah. right? I mean, if you look at, for instance, you know, drunk driving laws. I mean, look, drunk driving's a horrible thing, right? We don't want that. But, you know, uh, you know, drinking, drink, you know, like reaching over and, and changing your CD and, and, and not paying attention uh, could, could kill people. Falling asleep can kill people. Uh, and so if you take some activity which has a similar impact, we're, we're not going to treat it quite the same because we really don't see any upside. And, and mm -hmm. so in countries like Ireland, I think they're pushing the BAC down to like, I think it's like 0, 0.0. Uh, there's no safe level oh, wow. for, for, okay. for driving uh, and drinking. Um, and under the belief that, you know, what could possibly off offset yeah. uh, saving a few <laughs> lives, right? I mean, if you save one life, then, you know, that's, that's good enough, right? Is there, is there, 
what, what do you suppose accounts for this, um, I don't know, failure to uh, appreciate the benefits? And I don't think you could attribute it to just like this, you know, mohistic tendency that people have because, you know, a, a good utilitarian is going to kind of think through mm. all of the benefits, not just simply, you know, the the health benefits yeah. or... Uh, uh, the, the, even if you're obsessed with productivity, I can see why you might support coffee and, and tobacco. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but, you know, alcohol also contributes to at least a certain type of productivity. But we haven't, we've known that in kind of folklore, you know, the kind of, we know that artists, you know, associate with creativity and artists and innovation. And I think we know it at a folk level, but we haven't known it at an academic level which means it doesn't enter into public policy considerations. So I think what I hope, I mean, I'm hoping the biggest impact of my book will be on public policy, just because right now we have a purely medicalized view of alcohol. All we do is look at it from a medical perspective, in which case it's, it's a bad case to make for alcohol, right? It's, it's almost all from mm -hmm. a physiological perspective, almost all negative. Um, yeah, the cholesterol stuff, there's a debate about that. It's almost certainly swamped by all the negative effects of alcohol. Um, Every, everyone wants, everyone wants it to be I know, good for your heart. It's, it's so desperate, can, right? So We're just can, like, uh, the French right. paradox and all that stuff. Um, you grasp it at straws, but it's, people are so desperate because they're stuck within this medical paradigm. They, the solution is mm -hmm. not to like inflate the importance of the cholesterol studies. It's to just see the get out of the medical paradigm and see that alcohol is a, it's a cultural technology that we've been using as long as we've been so before we were in civilizations and when you see you know as you said if it's the only benefit is fun as i say at one point if the only benefit is fun fun is going to lose because fun has no value for public policy making um, or very little value Whereas if you see that, okay, maybe if we ban alcohol, um, we'll, we'll eliminate drunk driving, we'll lower liver damage, we'll lower cancer rates, domestic violence will probably go down. There'll be a lot of great benefits, um, but we'll be losing stuff. We'll be losing creativity. We'll be losing innovation. You know, I discussed that study. Um, it's correlational, but it's great uh, take, economists taking advantage of a natural experiment where prohibition got imposed at different times, the county level throughout the states. Um, and he showed that when uh, prohibition was imposed, innovation as measured by patent applications went down significantly, 15%, and took years to recover again. Um, and he attributes that to the closing down of saloons. So people were meeting in saloons and exchanging ideas, coming up with new stuff, and then that was all uh, public drinking was eliminated by prohibition. So you're losing innovation. Um, you're losing uh, the bonding that happens. You know, alcohol is a really important way of creating teams and getting people to work effectively together. And as I, you know, argued in the last chapter of the book, so I walked through all the dangers of alcohol in the last chapter, uh, especially the fact that it's become more dangerous relatively recently. Um, we're drinking, we have access now to distilled liquors, which are just wildly more powerful than the stuff we've been drinking for most of our history. Um, and alcohol was always consumed socially. So all cultures have these very elaborate ritual customs for keeping drinking under control and helping people to drink in a moderate way. If you live in the United States and you can go to a drive through liquor store and they load up your SUV with a case of vodka and you can drive it back to your home and drink as much of it as you want, that's evolutionarily unprecedented, super dangerous. <laughs> and, you know, we've seen like in COVID and pandemic lockdowns, um, problem drinking has gotten really out of hand. So, um, you know, there's a, there are all sorts of dangers to alcohol and we have to be aware of those. We need to learn to mitigate them. And it could be the case that even, you know, we consider creativity, we consider innovation, we consider bonding. And it's not... I could understand a policymaker going, okay, still no alcohol, <laughs> but at least it would be an intelligent mm -hmm. decision that's taking into yeah. account all the stuff that's being lost as well. And I just don't think, I think right now from a public policy perspective, we've been flying blind when, 
talking about intox- the role, proper role of intoxicants in, in individual human lives, but also in institutions and in the public realm. Um, so I just want to, I want the, the debate to be more intelligent in the sense of really understanding the functional benefits as well as the costs. So. Right. So what you just mentioned is kind of, uh, it, it's sort of bringing back that mismatch theory, right? So although we've kind of adapted to the use of, of alcohol, right? It was presumably within a, a, a ritual context mm-hmm. and it was not kind of, uh, you know, hyper powerful, mm-hmm. right? So we're drinking wine and beer. We're doing it within social settings. There are, um, norms around what is appropriate. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, in ancient Greece, there was sort of someone who was in charge of, of the drinks, right? Kind of like the, 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 the host yeah. or the bartender yeah. that would kind of make sure that everybody was, was not, um, and, and I think we have like in the law now we have, we have social host laws, which kind of make the, the host, rel- you know, liable if, mm-hmm. if things get out of hand. Right. And, and that's sort of an extension of that idea. But, but still, I don't, I think your point is that the, the, the social norms that we have in say the United States are, are, are not a good fit for the, uh, availability of, of alcohol and that we really need to rethink this. And, and you mentioned as a, as a parent, you know, um, I don't know whether this is going to get you in trouble with, <laughs> with the, the authorities, with the Mounties, yeah, the Mount- but you mentioned, have some Mounties showing up <laughs> you mentioned <laughs> that you would give your, your daughter uh, a little bit, a little bit of wine before her, her legal, uh, drinking age. Um, so, you know, if, if we're, we're trying to strike this, this balance, it's not something that's, that you, you can't just sort of allow this to happen naturally. You have to be very kind of conscious about um, balancing these things. And and I think that, you know, you mentioned um, the importance of alcohol for, for anxiety reduction and, and you, you referenced Freud. And I, I, I was thinking about Freud when you were, when you were writing this about civilization and its discontents mm-hmm. and how, you know, civilization comes with it, all sorts of, of costs. And, you know, you can, you can kind of mitigate some of those costs in, in some ways and make it a little bit less less costly, but you know the 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 poisons in the dose, yeah. right? Yeah. And you have to be very careful about regulating how how you you utilize this 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 uh, this potion. Yeah. yeah. So different cultures. So it's significant that it's probably the case that cross culturally, about fifteen percent of the human population is vulnerable to a propensity genetically to alcoholism. Mm. Um, actual alcoholism rates vary wildly culture to culture. And so I did talk about the difference between Northern and so-called Northern and Southern European drinking cultures where Northerners and the U S has inherited that, that Northern bottle. Um, you drink a lot of distilled liquors, you drink to get drunk, you drink to just drink. Like you, you there's no meal involved. You're just getting together and drink. Um, it's taboo for children. You know, it's something only grown-ups do. Children aren't allowed to touch it. Um, drunk public drunkenness is not only not shamed, but maybe it's even kind of celebrated. Like it's a manly thing to be really drunk. Um, that's a really unhealthy set of norms. It really leads to problem drinking very quickly. Uh, where Southern cultures uh, drink primarily wine and beers, um, they. Uh, drinking is always happening in the context of a meal in a social situation. You typically don't drink away from the meal table. Um, so it's all happening with everyone sitting around a table, sharing alcohol together. Uh, kids are introduced to alcohol at a very early age, you know, in Italy, which is the culture I'm most familiar with, you know, they get wine watered down when they're really young. And then at a certain age, they drink wine and it seems to result in just a much healthier attitude towards alcohol. There's also a, a kind of in Southern cultures, uh, uh, being publicly visibly drunk is stigmatized. There's something unmanly about being drunk. It's, so if you see some, a drunk person wandering around Rome, it's a German tourist or American tourist. It's not a local. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, cultures can do a lot to mitigate the dangers of alcohol. And I think it's worth thinking in about, you know, I have some kind of random policy recommendations, and one of them is paying uh, bartenders and servers a real salary. Because I had this experience, I worked in the Bay Area, you know, for 10 years, I worked in the restaurant bar industry. And I was completely dependent on tips. This was back in, Mm -hmm. scary to talk about how long ago that was, late uh, 90s, 90s. 
I was getting this alternate minimum wage. I was getting paid, I think, like $1.85 an hour because I, I was making all my money from tips. But that meant I was completely dependent on tips. And the way you make tips is to get people to drink more because it's high markup on alcohol. Yeah. Drunk people are more generous. Um, and yet, I really should have, my job should have been to be like the Greek symposiarch. I should have been the one moderating people and, you know, they order under glass. And I say, why don't you, have, you know, have bottle Pellegrino first. And if you still want a glass of wine later, I'll get you the wine. Um, but I would never do that. Like I would lose my tip if I did that. So there's a, you know, you're putting people's economic self-interest against what they should be doing to help society out. And there's such a simple fix for that, which is just as they do in Europe, um, pay, pay waiters a real salary and not Mm -hmm. make them dependent on tips. Um, I guarantee you worry about drugs. There's there's another, well, if you're worried about drunk driving, that's the way to, cut down drunk driving yeah. is give more power to bartenders and servers, right? Well, there's another nefarious practice. I worked in, in catering and, um, where, you know, you're catering a wedding, let's say, and, uh, you, you, you invoice for the number of bottles of wine that you, you sell. And so you typically go and, and kind of top off everybody's yeah. glass, yeah. you know, if you, and even waiters do this, yeah. you know, they systematically they top. And so, you know, my rule as a patron in a restaurant is I don't let the waiter touch the, the wine yeah. bottle. Because, you know, then you lose track of how much yeah. you're, you're, you're drinking yep. and, and, uh, and, you know, so it's, that's a, that's a really dangerous practice, I think as yeah. well. Yeah. So we just, there, there are policy things we could do to mitigate the cost, but I think if we're going to think intelligently about the role alcohol is going to play in as individuals in our lives and the way we want it to play the role it should play in our institutions. So we're at a university, should alcohol have a role? Should we allow professors to hang out with their grad students at the pub and have a pitcher of beer after seminar. Um, there's not easy answers to these questions and you can, you know, we're, we're really focused these days on all the costs and the dangers of letting that happen. But I think we've missed the, missed the positive sides. And so I just want us to see, see those as well. Well, I definitely, when I thought about being an academic, I thought it would be more like a uh, David Lodge yeah, novel right. and, and it turned out not to be. <laughs> yeah. and, and even, I mean, even Einstein and von Neumann, you know, they would always have drinks at five o'clock mm-hmm. in, in Princeton. And, and I, I always, you know, remember that, you know, Cambridge and Oxford, they always had the best uh, wine at high yeah. table. I've yet to see that at Berkeley. Yeah, no, Berkeley, <laughs> but, unfortunately, has not um, done that yet. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when I, when I think about the characters of, of Butcher Ding and, and Woodcarver Ching, who are making an appearance in your, in your book, um, uh, try not to try, um, you know, they have this, this, they have this Uwe, but I, it's hard for me to think of them uh, performing better if they were consuming alcohol, yeah. right? Is, is kind of Uwe like a, like a way of, 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 you know, tapping into something very similar to what we can tap into? Is it, is it, is, is the cultivated spontaneity, um, uh, a form of, of, of drunkenness in a way? Um, how do we think, how should we be thinking about, um, the relationship between the two books? It's a form, it's a form of drunkenness without the motor impairment, without the side effects of alcohol. I mean, it's similar things going on when you're, you're in a state of, you know, what Mihai Chicks and Mihai would call flow, right? You are engaged in your activity. You're like Butcher Ding or the wood carver. You're completely absorbed in what you're doing. Part of what's going on is your, your PFC has been turned down. Um, so in that sense, it's like drunkenness. Um, but in other ways, it's not. So if you, you know, and try not to try, I talk about that one neuroimaging study of where they managed to get jazz pianists in an fMRI machine and play do solos or play pieces or um that they have yet to do it with a butcher, they haven't I yeah, it's harder it's trickier to get the ox and the cleaver and everything <laughs> cleavers and fMRI machines don't mix very well um but they found that uh the neural pattern of neural activity when they're when they were successfully soloing like when they reported it, they were really in the zone soloing um was PFC activity down, but the ACC was still active. So the anterior cingulate mm-hmm. cortex <clears throat> and the ACC seems to work together with the PFC 
in kind of like an alarm sense, like the, when there's a mismatch between what you're doing in the environment or your system one program is running into obstacles, it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. The ACC lights up and says, Hey, PFC, come in here and fix this. We need a little top down control. Um, their ACC is active. So that seems to correspond to the state. If you talk to people who have been in these states, um, it's not oblivion. When, when you're drunk, the ACC is not no, active, no, right? It's not. So, you know, you just power through and, and you, you know, like, like the, if you're the Tesla, yeah. right, you, you just pop, crash into the wall and there's no, you know, alarm saying, hey, you know, wake up and grab the wheel, yeah. right? Yeah. So both are down regulated with alcohol. Um, plus your motor coordination if at high levels of inebriation is screwed. So you really don't want to be carving ox. Um, but yeah, so there are different, there are different ways to get into states of spontaneity. And trying not to try was about the non-chemical substance ways to do it. But this book is about, you know, another really promising shortcut, which is this, this chemical intoxicant uh, technology that we humans have been using in all sorts of different forms for all of our history. So there's a role for chemically induced spontane spontaneity, I think. So getting drunk on alcohol and getting drunk on, on heaven are they substitutes or are they complements, right? Presumably the alcohol plays a huge role in, in religious ritual, yeah. right? Yeah. They're complements, which is why most religions use chemical intoxicants as well in their ceremonies. Um, and yet you do have religions that don't use chemical intoxicants. And as I discussed in drunk, they use other methods, right? So Pentecostals will, you know, have these, long, really emotionally intense prayer sessions where they'll eventually start speaking in tongues, or handling snakes or do, doing these things that are where they're, they seem drunk, right? And that's the, uh, the early, uh, Bible account and New Testament account, Jesus' followers. People thought they were drunk when they were possessed by the Holy Spirit. Um, they're doing it through these other techniques. You can do it through singing and dancing. You can do it through sleep, sleep deprivation. You can do it through intense pain. So you can do it through self mortification. Fire walking can get you into the state. So there are there are a whole host of these non chemical ways to do it, um, and yet they're all kind of a pain in the ass. It's like really time consuming to do all these things. Right. Um, if you could instead have some alcohol mm -hmm. or take a little ayahuasca, you know, why not do that? So there's a good mm -hmm. reason that chemical shortcuts to these states have been a go-to for, for a lot of cultures throughout history. Right. So when I was reading that book, I was, I was trying to map it into some of the terminology that we, uh, that we know in, in sort of, you know, cognitive psychology and, and you mentioned flow and you kind of compare it to flow and, and, you know, you talk about kind of butchered ding is really in the flow when he's hacking op open this ox, but, but, you know, flow, flow as a state can, can apply to, you know, push pin as well as poetry. Right. I mean, it can be uh video games. Mm -hmm. I mean, video games have been designed yeah. so that they kind of tap into mm -hmm. this state of flow, but, but you're not really, you know, I don't think that, that any of the Confucians or, uh, would, would say, Hey, this, this is, this is fantastic. Like we've got you, you know, you're doing the, you're up there in your room doing the video games all day, you know, way to be. Yeah. It's there's, you can talk about dip flow like states that are not flow because chicks me. I wants to distinguish flow from, uh, zoning out to a TV show, you know, or watching stupid movies all day. Um, you know, if in a state of flow, you emerge from it feeling good, like you feel energized, you feel satisfied, you feel happy. There are some technologies that we use to get us out of our head where we emerge from them feeling enervated and dirty and kind of, you know, you, you just spent binge watch, you know, good, whatever, some stupid TV show. Um, you emerge not feeling very good about yourself. And I assume the same as with some sorts of video games. Um, so why is that? And Chicks Me I thinks it has to do with complexity and challenge. And I just think that contradicts his own data. His own survey data shows that. 
um, people are often experiencing flow <clears throat> in states that have nothing to do with complexity and challenge. So taking care of little kids, hanging around, talking to friends, taking a walk in the park in a, you know, a path you've walked a hundred times or something complex about it. Um, so I argue and trying to try what's, what distinguishes the way or the good kind of flow states from vegging out in front of the TV is that sense of being absorbed in something that you care about. So walking in the park, playing with a child, uh, weeding your garden is not necessarily complex, but it puts you into contact with things that you value human relations, relationship with nature, um, some certain type of beauty. Um, that's what makes it satisfying and rewarding. So that would be the equivalent, you know, the Chinese, again, the Chinese would tell a theological story. It feels good because you've gotten in touch with the Tao. Um, I don't believe in the Tao, but I think that the, the secular equivalent to that would be some, something larger than yourself that you value. And that's what makes these, these states satisfying. When you, when you were describing to tie it to another concept, I, I saw you describing kind of this state of someone walking through the world with this, uh, kind of eff what looks like effortless spontaneity. It made me think of, you know, sprezzatura, mm -hmm. right. And the art of the courtier, yeah. but, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not quite the same. Right. I mean, I, I think that there it's, it's, it's about looking as if you are, um, you know, that you, you don't care. And, and that's, I think that would that be more like the, um, what the village poser? <laughs> yeah, that would or be, is, that's is, exactly is, the village poser that Confucius was worried about. Um, and it's exactly uh -huh. the guy at the bar who's using the rules, you know, <clears throat> acting uninterested because that's rule number three or whatever to get a girl interested in you. Um, it's trying to strategically, it's trying to fake spontaneity basically to get the benefits of it. And typically, um, humans are able to see through that. Um, like I said, we're pretty good cheater detectors, we're pretty good at reading emotions. Um, but some people get away with it. And I think that people who are really good at it, like successful politicians and actors, um, seem to be able to pull it off by fooling themselves. They seem to have this knack for momentarily tricking themselves into thinking that they really are, they really do value the situation that they're in, even though they don't, <laughs> um, but they can engage completely in a way that seems convincing to people because they've half convinced themselves. Um, that seems to be one way around it that, that people use, but yeah, we, we don't like it. And we, we actually find it even in a way more aversive when someone's trying to fake spontaneity, like the person who's trying to act cool. There's someone who's just kind of not cool, but at least if they're just not cool, it's okay. They're just not cool. But someone trying to act cool who's not cool is much worse, right? <laughs> There's something pathetic or, or even kind of uh, disgusting about it as a bubble for us. Well, look, we're both educators and we both spent our time uh, around uh, younger people. Yeah. I was going to say young people, but let's just younger. say younger yeah, people. And, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and we're, you know, hopefully we're, we, we, we're trying to uh, help people, uh, kind of achieve something, um, and become better at, at something. And, um, when I hear at my business school, we have a, uh, one of our mottos is confidence without attitude. Yeah. And so I always see myself as like, you know, dialing, dialing, you know, one up, uh, and then dialing the other down. And we're trying to find that kind of sweet spot. Um, and, and when you're kind of teaching it at the university level, do, do you feel like you have to, um, you know, emphasize the, the kind of carve and polish side of things and, and, you know, whack your students with sticks and, <laughs> and get them to take things seriously? Or, or, or do you think that, you know, you have to kind of steer them away from the hedonic treadmill and get them to kind of, um, you know, let things go a little bit. I mean, if you, if you have this, this dial, uh, inspired by the, by Chinese philosophy, um, we, we, as a society, I think I, I can see, I can see both criticisms as, as landing, you know, squarely in, in our culture, our culture is both on the one hand full of, you know, hippie like folks that don't take things seriously mm -hmm. and, and others that are, you know, really, really working too hard yeah. at, at, um, you know, at self-cultivation. Yeah. Um, 
if I have to err on one side, I try to cultivate more the love, right? Let's, why is this cool? Why is this fun? Why is this relevant to your life? But in a way that you hadn't, wouldn't have thought of on your own, <clears throat> you know, so I try to, I, I try to not, I want to, I've been fighting against the exotic, exoticizing of China as if it's some radical other way of thinking. But there's a reason we study it, because it's actually more helpful in many ways than some of the Western models that we've inherited. Um, but at the same time, the, the stick is useful, too, because and in a way that helps students to help themselves. So um, I teach a flip version of my early China course where the students have to keep up with the lectures on their own at home because they're video lectures. And so I have weekly quizzes just to... And that's a very Han Fadesian legalist stick, right? <laughs> it's very enlightenment, you know, top down. But it's it's in a way in the service of getting them to be able to enjoy it. Because if they were so behind and trying to catch up last minute, they're not gonna have the background material to be able to talk about to talk in a way that would be um like put your ding really cutting up the ox instead of some completely untrained butcher hacking away. He wants them, they're not going to enjoy the discussion section unless they have some basis on which to discuss, unless they know the material. So I use some Han Fadesian techniques to get them to be able to be Taoist when they get into the classroom, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, Edward, this is fascinating. I think we could talk for a lot longer. Maybe uh, if we had a few cocktails, we could yeah, talk for, even yeah. longer. But I want to recommend... I want to recommend to everybody that they they check out uh, Drunk, a uh, really wonderful book. Also, Trying Not to Try. I mean, this is fantastic, and it really uh, made me want to uh, read a lot more uh, about the um, philosophers you reference. In particular, uh, Mencius is now my new favorite uh, philosopher. <laughs> for, uh, I'll have to dig deep into him. But also, um, you have this edX course, uh, which um, is available to anybody. Uh, on Chinese philosophy, which uh, I recommend to everybody. Uh, thanks so much, Edward, for joining me. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 